Sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get over 2,400 documentaries for free for 31 days. Link in the description. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. And yeah, I'm just gonna lean right into Betris' Law with that video title, right on in. So the story is this. A couple of days ago, Justin from the Art of Repair YouTube channel discovered that all of a sudden, swapping out the battery on an iPhone resulted in the newish battery health monitoring system turning off and popping up. Important battery message, unable to verify this iPhone has a genuine Apple battery, health information not available for this battery. Since then, we've seen headlines like Vice's, Apple is locking batteries to specific iPhones, a nightmare for DIY repair. And of course, iFixit's, Apple is locking iPhone batteries to discourage repair, and just a ton more like them. Now, I'm gonna push back kinda hard on using the term locking for any of this, not because I'm an evil Apple apologist or defender, even though I can feel some of you just itching itching to start typing exactly that into the comments right now, already. But wait, it's because I think it's just dumb and lets Apple off the hook far too easily. First, it's listed publicly on Apple's iPhone battery and performance page as applicable to iPhone XS, iPhone XS Max, and iPhone XR. And that page is last marked as updated back on March 1st. And archive.org confirms the information was there at least that far back. Second, Joe Rosignol has also shown an internal document from back in April that tells technicians to run RepairCal to make sure it doesn't happen with Apple repairs. RepairCal basically being repair and calibration system that authenticates the hardware for the software. In this case, there's a chip on the battery that has to be paired with the board, something that only Apple's tools can do. And if it's not, you get that warning. Again, the potential has been there for a while, but it's now active, and while I'm no expert, I'm guessing the same process could be used to not just disable the monitoring, but disable the battery, which there's no sign Apple is doing. But if and when they do, that would be a legitimate lockout. Now, according to iFixit, it can be worked around by swapping the original chip onto the new battery, but that's a much tougher and more onerous job. Apple has been investing heavily in making iPhones last longer. Everything from devoting most of the iOS 12 engineering resources to performance enhancement for older phones, to putting in chipsets with years of overhead, to providing updates longer than pretty much everyone else in the industry. So why make third-party repairs harder? Wouldn't they benefit the same strategy? Some of the coverage has focused on this being a move designed to deliberately hurt third-party repair shops and that it will make Apple look really, really bad. The first part is about as silly as saying right to repair is deliberately pushed to make a buck off selling high-priced DIY kits. It's just nonsense. Hurting third parties really sucks. It really sucks, but it's collateral damage here. And it's why the second part is bunk as well. Apple doesn't really care about looking bad in this particular instance. What Apple cares about is the words iPhone and burn. Catastrophic battery failures is what Apple cares about. It may seem like people didn't really care about Galaxy Note 7 having a failure rate so high, people were literally instructed over the intercom not to have them on any flights, but that's the nightmare scenario here. Ever notice that when Samsung was going through the whole Galaxy Note 7 thing, Apple didn't take any shots at them at all, like zero, because it's not a company thing, it's a technology thing. Lithium ion is the best mainstream battery we have right now, but it's far from perfect, and having lithium ion batteries explode or catch fire, get further restricted in terms of carry on or shipping, damage property, or worst of all, hurt real people, that's it, that's the end. And if you just can't bring yourself to believe that Apple or any other company really cares about property damage or personal injury, console yourself with this. They absolutely have to care about the legal exposure that comes with it and will do an awful lot to limit it as much as possible. And while some third-party indie repair shops are among the very best and most highly skilled in the world, some of them aren't. And those tend to be the ones that cause problems. And again, that totally sucks for the many, many great shops out there. But beyond the sensationalism and the victiminess, that's the real issue here that needs to be negotiated. I say negotiated for a reason. Apple didn't just lock out third-party battery repairs, but they sure as hell heaped a ton of stigma onto them. And at the 
expense of a super useful feature for customers. And that's why ultimately my thinking on all of this hasn't changed. I fully support the right to repair, but please don't make me quote Spider-Man here. It has to come with the responsibility as well. That includes provisions for the handling of potentially dangerous materials like lithium ion batteries, quality standards for parts where failure just isn't an option. And that includes batteries, but also authentication so bad actors can't just swap their way into your data. With severe penalties for shoddy work and security and privacy violations, like fixing your phone but stealing your nudes and sex, which, yes, has happened a bunch of times already as well. Because if you're going to regulate right to repair, you need to regulate repair as well. Otherwise, this is just about moving money and going from Apple, who's a big, easy target, to a bunch of much smaller, much less accountable targets with unknown benefits for consumers. And it should always be the consumer who benefits. In the meantime, I'm gonna hard agree with my colleague, Lori Gill. Instead of turning off battery monitoring, which is a hella passive aggressive move, Apple should just steal a page from MiFi and pop up an annoyer that says pretty much the same thing. Then each and every time you dismiss it, you get an estimation of battery health anyway, even in another color if they really, really have to. At least that's aggressive aggressive. Ass covered customer unimpacted. But I'd love to hear your take on this. How do you think we should balance cost and availability of repair with safety and privacy? Let me know in the comments. Quick thing too, rumors are again making the rounds about foldable Apple devices, but it's probably better to call these speculations rather than rumors because there are no leaks from supply chains as far as I can tell or Apple sources being quoted. Just yet more financial analysts making yet more reports to move yet more markets for yet more clients who are not us. So big grain of salt, huge. But I'll once again go back to, of course, Apple is working on foldables. Apple has enough resources to prototype anything and everything that makes any sense at all to prototype, and certainly anything any financial analyst can pull from their fever dreams. In fact, I first heard about Apple investigating folding devices back around the time of the very first iPad mini. They just weren't technologically feasible back then. I've also said multiple times already that the history of human technology is filled with foldables and that foldable devices are a part of the future for the same reason they're part of the past. Even made a whole video on it. But big butt, also huge, they're still not feasible. Huawei still hasn't shipped their Mate 10, and Samsung didn't even mention the Galaxy Fold at their Unpacked event this week. Did not even mention it. Foldable devices are still kindergarten tech, and we're really gonna have to wait until they graduate high school before they're usable. Maybe college before they're even enjoyable. Issues with hinges, screens, software, so much still needs to be solved and solved well. And I do think Apple is uniquely positioned by virtue of its full stack capabilities to solve it well, if not best in class. I just don't know how long it will take. And I know I absolutely want it to take as much time as it absolutely needs to. But maybe that's just me. Jump into the comments and let me know what you think. Fold later or fold now, now, now. So, you know, you could watch chocolate on Curiosity Stream. Chocolate perfection. Oh yeah, you heard me right. Here's the blurb. Michelle Rue Jr. sets out to discover the secret of chocolate. Not just why we're addicted to sublime and complex foodstuffs, but its rich and varied history. From a sacred drink of Aztec emperors to the aphrodisiac of choice at the court of Louis XIV in Versailles, France. Available worldwide on the web, on Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. Curiosity Stream is the world's first streaming service addressing our lifelong quest to learn to explore, to understand. Go to curiositystream.com slash vector for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series and enter promo code vector to start your membership completely free for the first 31 days. Thanks Curiosity Stream and thanks to all of you for supporting Vector. Now hit like, hit subscribe and force choke that bell gizmo so you don't miss the next video. And then hit up the comments and let me know what you think about any and all of these stories or better yet, what you want me to cover next. Thank you so much for watching and see you next video.